Gracie Jiu Jitsu rocks. Welcome to the Gracie Jiu Jitsu Rocks podcast, a podcast dedicated to Gracie Jiu Jitsu and all things Gracie, including self defense, competition, anti bullying, women's self defense and empowerment nutrition, and most especially, the people involved in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. This podcast is for the average Joe. It's for anyone who practices, trains, teaches, or just loves to talk about or hear about Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. We'll explore the lives of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu practitioners, how they got involved in the art, and what effect it's had on their lives. So buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to episode 54 of the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Rocks podcast. As always, I'm your host, Marty Josie, and thanks for listening. Today, my guest will be Pedro Sauer Black Belt, David Porter. But before we get to that, let's do our Jiu-Jitsu quote. And that is, even when you spar during training, you should minimize your natural talents. By limiting yourself, you may find yourself in a much worse situation but you are forced to think your way out using techniques you would not have otherwise used. When you start to do this, you begin to understand what is really wrong in a certain situation, and you begin to understand what actually needs to be done in a technical way in order to improve the situation. You then begin to develop a real, deep progress, understanding the mechanics of any situation. And that's from Master Hickson Gracie. So great words to keep in mind. Okay, on to our interview. So Dave Porter is a very accomplished martial artist. Besides being Master Sauer's newest black belt, Dave is a very successful jiu-jitsu competitor as well as an instructor at Professor Sauer's headquarters in Herndon, Virginia. Dave is sponsored by Lanky Fight Gear, and stay tuned after the interview. We're going to do a, a little contest, a little giveaway for our Lanky Fight Gear product. Also after the interview, we'll have the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. And today's guest host for that segment is going to be Mark Kukro, who's also a Pedro Sauer black belt and owner and head instructor of Integrated Martial Arts Academy in Harrisburg, North Carolina. Dave is a super interesting individual, so I know you're going to enjoy this interview. So without further ado, let's talk to Dave now. Okay, I'm speaking with David Porter. So welcome, David, and uh, thanks for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you for having me. Glad to be on. And you have the distinction of being Master Pedro Sauer's newest black belt. So huge, huge congratulations on this incredible accomplishment. Thank you much. It was uh, the biggest honor so far I've ever received, and it was a great, great time. Yeah. Well, tell us a little more about uh, that whole experience, about receiving the black belt. Uh, were you expecting it all? Did you know it was coming up, or was it a complete surprise? And just uh, describe kind of how that whole thing played out for you as far as about a year and a half ago my number one training partner john reeves and i we had training under master sour for you know decent amount of time and we're under the impression that hey we're brown belts let's make sure that when we're ready to test we look sharp we know what the curriculum entails professor sour made the promise to grandmaster elio gracie before he had passed that all of his brown and black belts would be tested under the master text that Grandmaster had put out. So you have uh, 55 standing self-defense moves and 20 um, self-defense moves involving weapons. And he wants to make sure that all of that, all of the people that he promotes to those upper ranks have uh, a well-balanced game, but also they know that self-defense. 
So John and I had spent, you know, something in the ballpark of 70 hours specifically just sharpening those moves for whenever we tested. And we knew that this upcoming summer was a Brazil trip that Professor does every year and that with it, we had the option to test. Well, getting closer towards the time of the trip, um, some things came about and I wasn't going to be able to take the trip any longer. So I was approached the day after my birthday, uh, July 25th, about potentially testing August 1st. So I had about a week notice of, hey, you're going to be testing next week. So I wow. called up a few people, got them, uh, got them the word that I would be testing and a few people made it out and it was great. I had like Robert Duvall and James Kahn show up and <laughs> it was uh, it was an awesome experience. Yeah, I, I saw a picture of that and, and you know, I was up at the Academy, I saw you a couple months ago up with the uh, Hicks and Gracie seminar in Master Sour and Robert Duvall was there then, which was a surprise. I I mean I had no idea why he was there or anything. Can you shed some light on why uh, he, as well as uh, James Conn, were, were there? Absolutely. So I am the principal instructor to Robert Duvall's wife, Luciana. Luciana is a blue belt and under Master Sauer. She's uh, got two stripes on her blue belt. She is a killer. Let me tell you right now. She, uh, awesome. she does not mess around. And she'll take anywhere from uh, – five to seven hours of training a week. And wow. most of that is private instruction with uh, me directly. And she'll tackle every topic from basic passing of the guard principles to how to do like a rolling crucifix from a turtle. And she is ridiculously good. So um, Robert, obviously, great. yeah, he, he completely supports her journey and he'll come in whenever there's a big event. He loves meeting the celebrities of our art such as, you know, Master Hickson, Master Pedro, and he's a big fan of mine, believe it or not, and I just uh, was very grateful to have him there for my belt test. That's really, really cool. So mystery solved. I'm glad I got the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> no sweat. So tell us a little more. Uh, I know you've been with Master Pedro for many years. Tell, can you speak a little bit to that relationship and how that's been for you uh, throughout the years? Absolutely. Well, I came to the headquarters after getting out of the United States Marine Corps in two, uh, the very end of 2012. And when January of 13 started, I knew that was the location I wanted to, to check out the most. Uh, I had been to a few other locations, such as um, uh, Dave Jacobs was running Fairfax Jiu-Jitsu at that time. I checked out Yamasaki. I checked out Ryan Hall's 50-50 Academy. And... Uh, you know, I really liked, I really resonated well with Professor Sowers Academy. And there was an instructor who is a brown belt then, black belt now, by the name of Ben Douglas, who was just jujitsu incarnate. And he was mm -hmm. the most technical guy I'd seen. And it took me a little while to find out that uh, in small circles, he's known as Mini Professor because he moves just like wow. Master Pedro and is uh, a living encyclopedia of all the different resources out there, whether it's the DVDs, the books, everything. He is just on point with all of that technique. So seeing him, even before I even met Master Sauer, was the, the thing that got me going. I was like, okay, I need to be here. If this guy can attain that level of proficiency under Master Sauer, then I'm at the right place. And, you know, over time, I think it was a few weeks, Master Sauer had gotten back from his uh, biannual Brazil trip where he does his camps. I met him and, you know, super charismatic guy. If you've ever, you know, had the pleasure of, of, of just meeting him or remembering that first time you met him, he mm -hmm. will completely draw you in with his big smile and his friendliness. And we hit it off. And it was a, it was a slow process at first because I had to take the seven years of jujitsu I had at that point and really open my mind to the new and improved ways that he was doing things and um, just not necessarily unlearning, but tweaking the things I had perfected or, or thought I was doing correctly to do it his way. And along the way with that, I found certain things were, were falling into place just rapidly. It's almost like the, the skies parted. So mm. when, when I came under, when I came under him, I was, doing okay in tournaments. I would win gold medals with what I like to call the will to win. I didn't necessarily have the skill to win, but 
I, I got the work, I got the job done. You know, I'd find myself on the podium. I thought I was doing great. And then when I met master Sauer, I realized I wasn't doing it efficiently. And then things started to click and I would get on the podium first place pretty often. And with faster times and more submissions, it was just an overall great experience where I built myself up underneath him. And he was right there uh, at the helm to help guide me and mentor me uh, as well as one of his black belts, Mike Horahan. They, they took me in and showed me the way and it's, it's been great ever since. Now I've got the man's face tattooed on my back and uh, I, I'm pretty much the ambassador for the headquarters. I go out everywhere and I preach about the, the proficiency of Master Sauer and how great his instruction is and how grateful I am for his tutelage. Wow. Well, since you have his uh, since you have his tattoo on your back, uh, there's no turning back now, right? <laughs> no, and I mean, why would I want to? The guy is so great. No, I completely agree. Uh, and to speak to uh, your point a minute ago about when you first meet him, yeah, the warmth and just the genuine energy, uh, just a incredible and passionate individual, and it just uh, draws you in. You you want to be around him a lot more. So it sounds like it was a real turning point for you, you know, coming under his banner and, and uh, learning more about the whole efficiency of jiu-jitsu. Absolutely. And to make my point even more um, dynamically, I'll say this. We had my my lineage, you know, coming up from New York and then traveling around through the Carolinas, the West Coast when I was in the military and traveling a bunch. I had to train under different banners all the time. And uh, the people who were responsible for giving me my purple belt, uh, Kevin Piles and Fernando Salvador, they were down in um, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and they fell under Mario Ayalo at the time, Professor Mario Ayalo, who was under Hoyler Gracie and was still Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, but you know, just different, different, uh, lines. Well, today, Fernando Salvador with us over with, uh, master Sauer, he's training with Mark Pucro down in his Academy, integrated martial arts. And I mm -hmm. last, I heard even Kevin piles, uh, was coming over. So it wasn't just me jumping around, uh, you know, the phrase Korean Yeah. Uh, you oh, know, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't looking, I wasn't looking for a belt. I never got anything fast or quick. But I came over because I wanted that proficiency. And then, lo and behold, my old instructors are even coming over. You can't help wow. but see the efficiency of what Master Sauer is doing. And like I said, he's just so friendly, and you want to be around him. It's intoxicating. So yeah. to make my point, even my instructors came over. Wow, that's really cool. That's kind of coming full circle and and, and moving in that direction. Um, you mentioned back when you were Purple Belt. Take us back even further. Uh what led you to martial arts and and how did you get started and what arts did you do before getting involved in jiu-jitsu? I grew up in the Ninja Turtle era. So, era. so for me, it was like uh, the cartoons I saw on TV got me amped up. I wanted to do backflips and vanish in a puff of smoke. So uh, I always wanted to get into it. And when I was about five years old, my mother was big into kickboxing and she made me and my, my brother and my sister start learning some techniques up directly under her and then took me to my first instructor, Brian Trafford, who was an Aki Kempo guy and led me down the path into karate and Kung Fu, kickboxing, Muay Thai. And I'd been doing that stuff ever since about 1988. Um, studied under this guy by the name of Mark Chen, who's a Sifu in Kung Fu, uh, did a bunch of different arts, took Sambo in New York city for a little while. Mm. Um, was wrestling in high school. And I know when you talk about martial arts, that's the one thing that's brought up in, in different, different groups, but not necessarily looked at as a combat art, but yeah, my wrestling was very pivotal in my development as a grappler. So I, I still give it the due diligence and respect it deserves as, as far as my, my training goes. Now I still wrestle fairly often. I, I work my takedowns. I talk takedown defense. And that was a big part of, why I gravitated towards, you know, Sambo. I had some wrestling background and then after Sambo, I went into jujitsu. So it's kind of backwards, <laughs> mm. but always been involved. I, I can say it's been 28 years now that I've been doing martial arts. Wow. Sounds like an incredible journey. Uh, much respect, you know, sounds like you've had a very interesting and, um, and, and quite a variety uh, associated with your training. So it sounds like you've, 
you know, always been someone who was into growing and learning and developing continual development. So props to you. Thank you. Thank you. And it, to make one other point on that, the diversity of it actually leads me back to Master Sauer for one more second. When I say this, he would always talk about having an open mind and he doesn't look at any specific martial arts poorly. He'll always find the good in anything that they might be doing. So even if it's a flowery movement, um, something that you would say is superfluous and unnecessary in a street fight, what is that movement giving you? Is it giving you range of motion? Is it making you healthier? Mm-hmm. Or is it working your flexibility? Or um, I think about most Krav Maga studios in the U.S., how they're not necessarily the same Krav Maga you'll find in Israel, but they're giving you those gross motor skills. They're giving you that reaction time. They're developing something out of nothing. There always is going to be a good portion of a martial art that you can really gravitate mm-hmm. towards. But you also have to have the open mindset that we have weaknesses. We have things that we need to cover. So Master yeah. Sauer is big on the cross training. He understands that you want to have really good stick and knife defense. Well, try Kali. He's worked with uh, Guru Dan and Asanto. Um, mm-hmm. He's worked with some of the best of the best, like, um, well, wow, why can't I think? Guru Dan's the big one. Um, Mark McFan, all, all these very, very prominent guys in the in the Kali community. Uh, you name it, he's worked with them. Mm. That's really cool. You know, I already had the most utmost respect for him, but hearing that, you know, just takes it higher because for him and for you, because I love hearing, you know, about the attitude of open mind and appreciating different arts. You know, I was just re- reading something earlier on Facebook. Somebody posted a, a video of, uh, they called it Kung Fu and a lot of people were calling it Salat and a lot of the Jiu Jitsu guys were just slamming it and like, you know, it's rubbish. It's not going to work. You know, it looks great if the, your Uki is just standing still. Uh, and the guy was incredibly fast, had incredible movement and got into this, you know, my art's the best kind of mentality. And I'm like, that kind of saddens me because, you know, all arts have a functionality, um, have a beauty. And like you said, there's strengths and weaknesses in a lot of different things. And, and you got to recognize that maybe your art isn't 100 percent strong on everything and seek out, you know, cross training or, or at the very least appreciating other arts for what they bring. And even if it's not their com- combat application, you know, what other uh, benefits do they have in practicing them? People, people everywhere are going to find a way to polarize themselves around a given topic. Um, it's hard for us. Anytime we're, we're very passionate about what we do to put that aside and look at something else and be tolerant and understand where it has its benefits. That's a Mm -hmm. very, very hard thing for anybody. So, I mean, we can make the reference and change it over to a football analogy where, you know, you, you cross the line into Ohio and next thing you know, you're a Buckeyes fan and you're rooting for your team and you hate every other team. Hey, that's fine. You know, it's great to have that, that sense of pride in your thing, but, Give credit to the other teams. Those guys are also good. This person is here. And, and we're like that with everything, whether it's our yeah. hobbies or our recreation, you know, whatever. It's fine. But you will always, at some point or another, just bump into that person who's a fanatic. And you know the phrase, don't feed the trolls? When yeah. I go on the internet, I just stay out of it. My posts yeah. on my social media page are almost jujitsu entirely. And I think for every one post about myself, there's five posts about a friend of mine, uh, Mm -hmm. Master Sauer, uh, some event somewhere. Because, you know, your successes should be spoken about through other people. And the other Mm -hmm. thing is, you don't want to get political. You don't want to get into any kind of topic that's generating negativity or has that potential to snowball into something not working towards bettering yourself. And that's what a lot of this is. It's just distractions. And I don't need that because for me, I'm doing about 37, 40 hours a week of jujitsu. And that's, that's a lot of time on the mats where I just don't want to come home and deal with drama. I want to come home. I want to eat, shower, sleep, relax, you know, whatever. I don't want to go online and get aggravated. So I stay away from that junk. 
But I did see that video you're talking about, and that guy was phenomenal. If we yeah. uh, if we could just appreciate the ten thousand hours aspect, whether you're a right. bricklayer or that guy who's doing those moves, he's a master of his craft. Respect it. Give him give him the the credit he deserves. Well said. Well said. I completely agree. We, you know, we've all been probably guilty at one time or another of, of drinking the Kool Aid of of our art and. I've studied various arts along the way as well, and, and I certainly was 100%, you know, Kempo Karate when I was doing that, and thought it was the end all be all. And and it's a great art, nothing negative to say about it. But um, my passion now is Jiu Jitsu. But I completely agree with you. Don't waste time on drama and negativity. I mean, let your life be about, uh, you know, letting a light shine and being positive and being a great example for people. So, I think you're doing that well, very well, sir. Much appreciated. And real quick, last night I. This is just as current events as possible. I had a brand new student um, by the name of Dana, uh, nice, nice gentleman. Uh, I don't want to do him the disservice of trying to guess his age, but you know, I'd say you know, middle-aged man comes in. He's got a white belt, a few stripes on it, and he he did two things in the course of our class. He asked me if he should take his stripes off since he plans on starting with us, and then the other thing was he starts talking about his background in other martial arts. Well, first I told him, no, don't take off your stripes. You earned those wherever you were from and we endorse it. And if anything, we'll be happy to show you the, the way we do things, but please don't, don't think that it's starting over. And the other thing was take that martial arts experience you have and think of it as hours on the mat or hours in training, hours thinking about combat. Now just apply it elsewhere. Don't try to make certain things overlap. Just compartmentalize, understand where your martial art was effective and where what we're showing you is effective as well. And then when it's time for you, you decide what you want to use. It's kind of like the uh, passing the guard versus leg locking conundrum, where some people think you shouldn't teach a lower belt leg locks right away because they'll never pass the guard. Well, whenever you do teach them that leg lock and they get into that scenario, they have the two paths. Which one is the higher probability of happening? The pass or the submission? They'll decide. And I told mm. this to this guy on, on his very first class, and he was so appreciative. And he went to my boss and told him, hey, I got some of the best advice ever from that instructor over there, and uh, I'm grateful I came in tonight. So That's great. That open mindset goes so far. It really does, and what a way to illustrate it. That's a, that's a really great thought. So looking back over your journey you know, throughout the years and, and all the different arts, and then especially now with jiu-jitsu, our having reached the milestone of black belt, are there any milestones that stand out along the way or any philosophical tips or things that uh, stand out, any pearls of wisdom that you can share about completing this journey? Yes. So for starters, I'd have to say the biggest milestone prior to meeting Master Sour was getting my purple belt because when I was, when I was a blue belt, I had stopped for about nine months and I enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. I went through basic training. I had an injury to um, that was pretty catastrophic. I had torn just about every ligament in my left knee, went through about nine months of recovery on that and didn't grapple, didn't do any kind of training. And when I finally got back into it, or when I was on the fence over getting back into it, I just happened to be walking by this uh, gymnasium on Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. And I see these guys throwing these really bad punches and kicks And I go, oh, man, I got to go in there and help these guys (laughs) come to the rescue. And I walk in, and then I also see some guys grappling. And it was this full-on MMA club that was just running out of the back of the Area 5 gymnasium for the All-Marine wrestling team. I see these guys in there. and You know, some people had a little expertise in striking. Some had takedown information because they were coming from the wrestling backgrounds. Um, Then there was a group of jiu-jitsu guys and their geese. And I go in and I just start, hey, asking questions. I'm Dave. What can I what can I say about this, that, and the other thing? Where where are you guys working out of? And when do we meet? Next thing you know, they they pulled me in to teach the striking, and that was my that was my specialty at the time. Whereas I was a I wouldn't say a cruddy blue belt, but I wasn't anything special at that point in time. And then uh, the purple belt who was running this program, Thomas Kubaki, who's now a black belt under Jared Weiner. He was 
amazing even then. And he was showing me all kinds of new tricks and it just ignited this fire. And under his tutelage, I started doing really well. And through him, we were associated with Kevin Piles and Fernando Salvador out of Winston-Salem, those guys I mentioned earlier. And within a short period of time, I was winning a lot of tournaments. I was getting technically proficient. And then I tested for my purple belt. And I never thought that was going to happen. When I, when I had blown out my knee, I thought I was done grappling. I didn't want any kind of torquing of my, of my limb. I, I didn't want to risk going through that struggle of rehab again. And just to attain my purple belt was such a momentous occasion. And unfortunately, I deployed like three days later on my first combat deployment. And that uncertainty of not knowing whether I'll come back and if I, if I get injured overseas, how bad could the injury be? Will I be able to keep doing jujitsu? And obviously now knowing I came back healthy and fine, that's one thing. But it, it definitely played into my mindset a little bit. And while I was overseas, I didn't have a chance to train, but I was reading material or I would download a video or, you know, um, uh, before I left, I, I had downloaded all this material onto a, a flash drive and I would just review and review and review. And when I got back, um, I dedicated my first tournament as a purple belt to a friend who had passed away overseas with me. And believe it or not, I won my first purple belt tournament without having really trained for it. Just on that, once wow. again, that will to win that desire. And that was, uh, that was probably the biggest milestone after receiving my purple belt was testing myself with it, having not really put in that time, but really just focusing my mindset to getting the job done. Mm -hmm. And I went out on the mat and I was fired up and it wasn't aggressive. It was very well executed. And I just had this picture in my mind of, of, of completing every match a certain way. And I did it. And that was huge. And that was probably wow. the biggest one um, over the years. And I, I ended up winning. I sent my gold medal to my friend Johnson's mom. And it was a big deal wow. to, to send that to her and really appreciate what he did for me when I was in the service, which was taking me under his wing and telling me to not quit doing the jujitsu. Mm. And that's huge. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And, and uh, thank you for serving, by the way. My pleasure. Respect thank to you, you and your fellow Marines. I, I would argue one point on that. Not that your will didn't take you uh, to victory, but I don't think it was your will alone. I think you having the foresight and, and taking action to watch the videos and utilize that mental training. I mean, you know, the, there's so much that we can do uh, with our mind and with mental training. So it wasn't like you stepped away for nine months and weren't even uh, looking at it, thinking about it or anything like that. So you were still putting that into your mind and kind of program yourself for success. And then when you got on it, you just physically, you know, took care of business. I agree with that. It's just, we do, we do lose a little bit of sharpness when we step away in terms sure. of our physical ability to execute the mechanics. So when you talk about a fighter who's had a long hiatus from the cage, we talk of, uh, we talk of that as ring rust. Well, I had, yeah. I had a bit of that going into that tournament, but I got to say it wasn't, um, it, it wasn't that bad considering uh, it was only a short period of time in the grand scheme of things, only a few months, not necessarily years, but purple belts really hard. Purple belts was the belt that's kind of the crucible of jujitsu. Uh, when people ask me, what, what the hardest part of my journey was, I tell them it was breaking into the ranks of purple belt, defining what it meant to, to, to be a purple belt, and then making that eventual step over to brown. And then brown belt for me was the last two years, and it was great. I felt like things were just lining up, and purple belt was a hodgepodge of different things, and I didn't know whether to play spider guard. I didn't know whether to play... Uh, you know, top game pressure and takedowns, whether I wanted to add judo to my game, what kind of grips I'd like, not using grips, foot locks, when to use them. And purple belt was just chaotic. So um, that point in time, you know, being a, a brand new purple belt even was, was hell on me. But having that focus was big. And I think if we can all give ourselves a, a, a really good goal before stepping on the mats, whether it's today, I'm not going to BS with my training partner and be on vacation. I'm going to come in. I'm going to drill the move. 
and I'm going to drill it as many times perfectly as I can. And if it's slow, it's slow, but I'm going to do them properly the whole time. And that's my goal. You know what? You're going to have a great night training if you come in with a goal. But mm -hmm. so, so many times we go in just because we want to clock the hours or because we know we haven't been in in a week and we just need to get on the mat. Well, that's good too, because we're going to get something, but focus is big. Focus is epically big. And for me, having Johnson, my friend, and my thoughts, it was that catalyst to get me going. And then obviously coming back home, it was how do I keep that momentum going? How do I continue with the success? And the focus stayed with me from then on. Wow. I love hearing you talk about focus. I believe that's one of the most important things in any endeavor is just really being able to, you know, get away from the distractions and really laser focus on where you want to go, what you want to achieve. And uh, beautifully said uh, just now when you talked about, you know, you can haphazardly show up and you're still much better than the person who isn't showing up for training for sure. Correct. But not, not near what you could be getting out of it when you're really focused and you have a plan and you go execute it. So uh, what about when you're not on the mat, uh, Dave? Do you have any hobbies or do you have time for anything else or is it strictly jujitsu all the time? So it kind of goes in two different ways. I'm a huge movie buff and I love catching up with uh, friends or, you know, just even myself and my, and my significant other will go to the movies and that's fine. But movies in general, I, I, I don't know. My mother was big into movies. My grandmother was huge into movies. I still remember being a little kid and her taking me out for matinees on the weekdays. And for me, it's just that chance to get engrossed in the fantasy or the, or the whatever is playing through the cinema and lose myself in the story. And that was always just a great experience. And I kept that to this day. And when someone tells me, Oh, Rotten Tomatoes gave it such and such. I'm like, I don't care. I just want to go experience the movie, you know? And <laughs> I, I still do that. I'm probably going to go see suicide squad tonight. Who cares? You know, so Rotten Tomatoes says it's terrible. I, I'm a big right. comic book nerd. Um, more, D, more Marvel than DC, but you know, how can a movie be bad if it's got a, uh, you know, Harley Quinn, jumping around, bashing people with a baseball bat. So I'm going to go check it out. Um, and then the other thing <laughs> I like, fun. and the other thing I like to do is be outdoors. So uh, nature walks, hiking, all of that stuff. Um, I recently got into, and by recently, I mean the last two years, got into rock climbing, mostly indoors. And let me tell you how, how important that's been towards my development in terms of jujitsu. Um, the grip strength training is, probably the thing that everybody will jump to at first, but I'm going to say the last thing that they'll think of, which is the problem solving. Um, you're using your body to solve a problem and, and it's against two factors, gravity and fear of falling, right? And you have to stretch in certain ways. You have to tilt and turn. You're going to use different parts of your hands, your feet, your elbows, your knees to just adhere to the surface um, you're, you're, you're hanging off of. You can do top roping. You can boulder where you don't have a rope. You can do uh, lead climbing where it's just you and one other person on a line and you're running it up as you go. It's an incredible experience if, if you've ever taken part in it. But, yeah, the rock climbing is big, and that's just a part of what I like to do. But uh, if, if I'm going to be outdoorsy, I'll go for a walk and I'll go bouldering. Um, otherwise, if I'm – being exceptionally lazy, or at least if there's a really shiny new movie coming out, I'll go check that out. Those are pretty much my hobbies. <laughs> Those are some great ones. The uh, rock climbing sounds really interesting. I've, I've never had a chance to do that, but the way you uh, kind of framed it on what all you can get out of it and how that could even translate you know, into some of your jiu-jitsu as well. Uh, if I ask you to name, kind of put you on the spot, but uh, if I ask you to name your top three movies of all time, which ones would come to mind? Oh, Princess Bride right off the bat. You you can't say you can't say a bad thing about that movie. Probably one of the most <laughs> quotable movies of all time too. Right, um, right. You know, from Andre the Giant's just subtle wisdoms to just hating Vicini and saying inconceivable a thousand times. Uh, you know, <laughs> it, it was just great from yeah. beginning to end. Princess Bride's probably Classic. my favorite favorite movie of all time. Right, um, right following that and you know i'm probably going to get some crap for this but i love the movie snatch 
you know, some people say they oh, can't yeah. understand uh, Brad Pitt's character, and I think that's the part that makes it the best. But Jason, hey, right, right. Jason Statham in a non-violent role where he's kind of like a pushover, um, that's cool too. It, you know, accept it for what it is. He's not in an action flick, or he's in an action flick, but there's no action out of Jason Statham. He's just uh, uh, part of the cast. But right. another very quotable movie. And then, you know, topping my... Yeah. Topping my movie selection is uh, Rounders. You know, Matt Damon and Ed Norton as these oh, yeah. back alley card sharks that are grinding their way through to make up some lost money, uh, some life lessons to be learned in that. And I, I make a lot of poker references when I'm teaching my jiu-jitsu about not showing your hand. And sometimes mm-hmm. your, your bluff has to pay off, but it's all about bluffing when you have position. You can't bluff on the table when you don't have the chips to put in and you know, the, I talk about it all the time, but yeah, Snatch, Rounders, mm-hmm. and The Princess Bride, I think those movies are pretty pretty far up there on my list. And uh, Those are some great ones. I mean, I could go into a top 20, but yeah, those, Any, top, those top three. Anything with Edward, Edward Norton has got to be up oh, there because he's just a phenomenal I, actor. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, I watched one of my favorites just the other night, uh, Tombstone. Oh, oh, that's a great one. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's in my top <laughs> Talk 20. about quotable. Yeah, yeah, some great quotes in that one for sure. Yeah. Um, and you, uh, you've you been busy doing seminars lately, um, one of which uh, was down in my neck of the woods around Durham, North Carolina. Really wanted to make that one, but unfortunately wasn't able to. And that was at uh, Elevate MMA with uh, Cody Maltes. And sounds like you've been busy doing doing some good stuff with those. Correct. And I'll say this. Uh, Cody Malte, who's a, another Marine veteran, he and I met. As, as a part of doing a super fight, we got scheduled to do Toro Cup 2 together. And I knew that he was a Robert Drysdale black, or at the time, uh, brown belt. Robert Drysdale brown belt on the verge of getting his black belt. And that he was a Marine veteran. And that's about it. And when I finally met the guy, man, instant friends. We just have so much right. mentally in common in terms of perspective and training practices and what we what we like to do is very similar his guillotine game is very similar to my my arm and choke darce and anaconda game and we both like to play footsies as i call it with the leg locks (laughs) and we had the most memorable and epic match at toro cup two and if anybody listening ever has a chance to look it up on uh on the, the good old interwebs i'm pretty sure you can find it on youtube fairly easy and it was just such a fun match. And we were, you know, booping each other on the nose. We're smiling. We're joking. We're talking to the ref, you know, all the stuff that you really shouldn't be doing when you're trying to win. But <laughs> we, we just had such a great time. And I mean, the submission exchanges in that match were just incredible. And then we stayed in touch and he got his black belt and he opened a school. And I think the first three seminars he had, he had, um, Robert Drysdale, obviously, his his instructor and all around awesome guy, one of the few people to ever beat Marcelo Garcia. So he's legendary on that alone, mm-hmm. street cred for life. Sure. And Robert Drysdale came in, and uh, I'll kind of tie this into my seminar. But Robert Drysdale came in, and then Cody had C.J. Murdoch, who's another lone guy in the Carolinas, black belt mm-hmm. um, under Jerry Moreno, and Jerry's place was uh, a place I would go to. Not not frequently, but, you know, I'd been there three or four times when I was in the Marine Corps not just to kind of elevate my game a little bit. No pun intended since I'm talking about Elevate MMA, but, you know, um, CJ taught a seminar and then I did. And I was flattered that Cody would even think of me, but he had me come in and we had, I think, 27 or 28 people show up for the seminar, which was great. And nice. it was in support of the cage side uh, concussion cast and the guys with uh, cage side uh, MMA and they were moving triangle BJJ to a new location and they wanted to do a fundraiser. And I told them, Hey, uh, if you find me a place to to run a seminar, I'll just donate my, uh, my earnings. And they couldn't believe that um, because, you know, there's not really that much money in jujitsu unless you're some incredibly famous celebrity um, or jujitsu royalty. And I am neither. So for me to take that, that and just give it to those guys they were very flattered but for me i'm just looking at it like they're giving me the opportunity to travel share the art 
put the spotlight on me and my, my teaching skills, not just my competition uh, accolades. And that's, that's critical to me. I want to be known as uh, Dave Porter, the instructor, not Dave Porter, the, in- the competitor. So mm. teaching at um, Elevate was great. But even more so when I heard stuff like, man, you know, Drysdale's got this incredible way of doing the Doris and yours is just different. And for some people, it was clicking better. And that's what I want to hear. I want to hear that, you know, my weird take on things will resonate with somebody because I firmly believe there's multiple ways to do a move. There's a thousand ways to skin a cat is the phrase. We want to make sure Mm -hmm. that we have that ability to not just pigeonhole ourselves into one way of doing it. And if we can get another uh, fresh set of eyes on it, that's usually how we're going to solve the problem. So it was an awesome experience teaching at Cody's. He and I uh, ultimately had a match the following day. That was also very fun. And um, (laughs) I wore a luchador mask and we had a blast and it was just like goofy as anything. And um, I've been to tournaments where he's got his guys and we're kind of like, I don't step on his toes and coach his guys, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm right there helping them out mentally, get ready, focusing, um, sure. shout outs to Kevin and Cheyenne. Like those two guys are killers out of his place. They're both white belts, but I mean, they are focused and those, those two guys are going to do great. I mean, his whole Academy is going to be awesome, but still in the, still in the infancy stage, I think he just started his kids program and I wish those guys all the best. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Shout out to them for sure, and um, definitely next time you're down in that neck of the woods or, or around here, I'll be sure to make it as well. Cool. So let's shift a little bit to uh, what advice do you have for newbies or someone just starting in jiu-jitsu? So I had a student who was brand new about three or four months ago named Jay, and Jay comes up to me and he says, okay, everything sucks right now. <laughs> and I start laughing because, you know, we all remember that is if you have no experience whatsoever, or even if you have another martial arts experience, but it's not grappling based jujitsu is so foreign things that are, in, mm-hmm. are intuitive in everyday life are counterintuitive when we start to grapple and things that are being taught seem counterintuitive to us when we're watching them until we learn all the mechanics. So for him, he was saying, if you could start all over, what would be the one thing that you would really just make your, your, your goal? And it took me a little while to think about it. So I got back to him by the end of the class and I said, base, if you can make your base, your priority, if you could figure out how to just not be swept, how to not move out of a position, how to not be thrown around like a rag doll and just settle, you're going to have a, you're going to have a, a really big bargaining chip in terms of what the next action is going to be. So to parlay that into some experiences that most of us encounter when we're, when we're looking at the academies as a whole, some brand new person comes in, they say they've never done jujitsu and immediately they start housing other white belts and you can say, see that they've got incredible base. And then you go, did you used to wrestle? And (laughs) to some people, that's an, that's a backhanded compliment, right? (laughs) Right but it's really a compliment. It's like, Hey, you have good base. You're clearly using something to your advantage right off the bat. That's putting you ahead of your peers. Now, why should that be a bad thing? It's, it's not, I don't look at people bringing wrestling to the table as like this uh, boogeyman, like, Oh man, you're cheating. You're, you're, you're wrestling. No wrestling is great. Some of the (laughs) best guys in the world who do jujitsu also wrestle or work on their wrestling. And I would say if you could develop that sensitivity to not being turned over, to mm-hmm. not losing your balance inside someone's guard, um, holding your positions when you're on top, mount me on belly and stuff like that, it's so big. And then with that, when we talk about how critical posture is to not being submitted, to um, moving where we want to move hips first, you're only going to have good posture if your base is good. So I would say base comes before posture. And if you're a newbie, um, there's some great four point base drills. Um, I know every, every place has their way of doing it, test out different methods. There's, uh, um, Jerry Costa goes by kid Peligro. He's known Mm -hmm. for being one of the best people around for his, uh, gymnastica movements, 
do that stuff. It teaches you how to find your ba- your balance. And gymnastica is one of those, um, ex- uh, what's the right word, auxiliary things that are kind of on mm-hmm. the periphery of what we work, but we do them in our warmups. We just don't do them to that extent. But if you could really right. find time in your day to do that, it's more beneficial than yoga. It's more beneficial than you know, uh, any other kind of stretching movements and stuff like that. It's, it's teaching you how to balance through everything else. Mm-hmm. But if you don't have that, I definitely suggest yoga. I've been doing yoga on and off um, for the last couple of months, and that's really helped even me at this stage of the game. So base, that's right away. That's great, man. The uh, gymnastica, you know, I, I agree that some of the best stuff you could ever do, especially uh, as you get older as well, because it's so good for your, your movement and your mobility uh, long term. Mm-hmm. Have you, uh, are you familiar with Phil McLaurice's DVD, uh, Yoga for Fighters? Absolutely. Great stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great one for sure. All right. Uh, before we close, do you have a favorite motto or quote uh, that you'd like to share? Oh, I've got a few. I don't know how I can narrow it down. <laughs> uh, uh, well, fire them out, man. However many you want to do. Well, sometimes I'll show I'll show a technique in a class, and then uh, you know I get the crazy looks as if I have two heads, and then I try to remind the students that if you spell the word success, it starts with suck first. We're we're not great right off the bat, so you have to work towards it, and you have to understand that in the beginning it's not going to be great. Um, so I use that one a, a decent amount. Master Sowers, I love it. Yeah, Master Sowers famous for saying, "You never see a mouse trap chasing the mouse." <laughs> so, yeah. you know, for us, we we sometimes chase things, and then we got to understand that sometimes we don't need to chase. Let them come to us. Mm-hmm. And with that, I kind of make my version of it, which is, you know, you never try to fit a square peg into a round hole. We're we're meant to do things when the appropriate time arises. But when you try to fire when it's not the time to fire, uh, things just kind of fall apart. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I'm a huge proponent of uh, working hard, and people look at me and they're like, what the hell are you doing in here still? The first one in, the last one out. And then a good example before I get into this last quote is um, a student of mine, Rich, who's uh, another Marine Corps veteran. He's an older gentleman. He retired as a chief warrant officer. He was in the very first class with Master Sauer, and we were doing a sweeper submit drill, and the upper belts were playing guard, and the lower belts would have to walk in, go into the guard, and try to pass. And the upper belts would sweep or submit the person in their guard. He walks in, we shake hands, and by the time we were done shaking hands, he's on his back. And he looks at me, and he's laughing, and he goes, wow, that was easy. And I look at him straight in the face, and I'm dead serious, and I go, no. That was 11 years of hard work. Mm. And he never forgot right. that. And so when I tell people that the dictionary is the only place where success comes before work, because the mm. dictionary is alphabetical, you know, they're like, wow, success before work. Yeah, you have to work to yeah. be successful. So I think that's my big one. Those are really great. Thank you for sharing those. No sweat. Uh, any, uh, anybody want to shout out to or acknowledge uh, before we close, Dave? Yes, uh, and I'll make this very quick. So Dennis Barangan is a first-degree black, sorry, second-degree black belt under Master Sauer. And Dennis is one of my primary training partners and one of the most humble people I've ever met. Over the last few years, even though I was not a black belt at the time, he recognized that I had certain skill sets and a mindset of being open. And he dedicated himself to learning some of my craft, even though he was an upper belt. I share that story mm-hmm. because I think upper belts out there um, start to kind of um, get a little too uh, cloistered and they, they, they clam up and they, they try to make themselves isolated because they don't want to appear weak. And some people stop training as much with their students because they don't want to you know, eventually get tapped by a student and look bad. Trust me, there's no such thing as looking bad. It's all learning. It's all working. It's evolving. If we never evolved, uh, if, if the Model T was perfect, we would have never gotten rid of it. You know, we keep changing every year. So yes. let things break down. Let things work themselves out. And then you'll get better too. And when Dennis was doing that with me, it just opened my mind to, you know, what it's like to 
open up my game and start experimenting with things. And then my blue belt buddy, Sam starts tapping me out and he's all excited. It's like, Hey man, it's going to happen. I, I gotta, I gotta work through other things too. So big, big one to Dennis for being so, so down to earth and awesome and really helping me out along the way too. And, and mentoring me. The other one, John Reeves, my training partner, who is my uke for my black belt test. And I try to tell people this on a regular basis. Your test is only going to look as good as your uke. <laughs> So he made me look awesome and I couldn't be anywhere without him. He works with me all the time and we're, we're going to keep growing together. And then obviously we've already talked about master sour, how if uh, jujitsu is the light, he is the candle that produces it. And I'm just the mirror that tries to reflect him. So, you know, big wow. shout out to master sour for being awesome. And that's actually a Francis Bacon quote. So don't think I'm super, super deep or anything. Um <laughs> And then uh, last but not least, I would have to say, uh, you know, Jeff Shaw in the community down there is one of the friendliest people in the universe. And he is trying to put North Carolina BJJ on the map, doing all kinds of things through media to make that happen. And one of the most open people I've ever met. And uh, I couldn't have asked for a better friend than Jeff Shaw. So he's constantly giving me tough matchups and hooking me up with places to stay when I come through, or at least talking about great things. And um, Jeff's a really good dude. So yeah, big shout outs to uh, Dennis Brong and uh, my friend, John Reeves, Jeff Shaw, and obviously the master Pedro Sauer. Right on. Well, I want to say a big thank you to you. And again, a huge congratulation on your black belt. I'm sure a long time coming, well-deserved. And uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to share some of your story and your insights with us. Uh, I'm sure everybody's going to benefit greatly from, from hearing your story and your, your insights, man. Thank you. No sweat. Thanks for having me one more time. Have a great day. Thank you, David. Take care, brother. Okay. Really enjoyed that interview. As I mentioned before the interview, Dave is sponsored by Lanky Fight Gear. And recently he posted a picture on his Facebook page, which, uh, which kind of all the buzz, uh, there were a lot of comments about the shirt, and it's and the shirt says leg locking is not a crime. So, really cool shirt. Uh, a lot of people are certainly looking forward to that shirt coming out. So, we have arranged to give away one of these shirts to one of the listeners. So, well, let's make this a fun thing. We've got two questions for you to answer. What branch of the military did David serve in? And what did he say was his favorite movie of all time. So if you can be the first to respond with the answers to these two questions, you can either respond on the episodes page or directly through email. And both of those would be at www.gracyjujitsurocks.com. So good luck and have fun. Stay tuned now for the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. Hey everyone, I'm Mark Cookrow, uh, Pedro Sauer Black Belt, and a head instructor of Integrated Martial Arts Academy in Harrisburg, North Carolina. And today I want to talk about a quote from John C. Maxwell. And if you don't know who he is, I highly recommend looking into uh, his work. And the quote is, A word of encouragement from a teacher to a child can change a life. A word of encouragement from a spouse can save a marriage. A word of encouragement from a leader can inspire a person to reach her potential. And from our perspective, uh, whether it's your family or from teaching martial arts or jujitsu, if you ask a child, and oftentimes I'll do this, I'll ask a child, what do you hear more of uh, when someone teaches you? Do you hear yes or do you hear no? Do you hear yes with a correction and some form of encouragement? Or do you hear no, not like this, no, 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 no. And I have not yet had a child tell me that they hear more encouragement than they do no with some kind of correction that usually escalates into a consequence. And so if you could think about the way you communicate with people, you're going to get more of what you encourage. If you have a negative response 
and it's corrective, but it has a negative tone, you're probably going to get more of that. It's going to be from their expectations, from their reactions to you. If you say, okay, everything you did to this point was great. We need to fix this one thing. Let's try it this way and have an encouraging approach to everything. I guarantee that you're going to get positive or more positive results. Very often, whether it's at work, whether it's at home, whether it's for people that we just meet, uh, if you think about the way that you encourage things to change, you will probably think about it a little bit differently. And, uh, you know, you can even just go home and have an experiment. If you have kids, you can do this. Just ask them to imitate you um, and maintain a sense of humor about it. And just say, how would you, how are you normally corrected? And how, or how, how are you normally encouraged? And you'll learn a lot about the, what, how they see things. But um, as instructors, especially in martial arts, uh, you know, the kids and, and students, they want to come to our classes and they want to be encouraged. And they want to leave feeling better than when they arrived. When you come home from work, people really want to see you in a good mood and, ha and hear an encouraging message and have a conversation um, that's very positive. When you're at work and someone works with you or for you and you're on a team or you're part of a team or you're in charge of a team, um, I can tell you that encouragement goes a lot farther than issuing consequences and threats. So think about that. You're going to get more of what you encourage. Ask yourself, do I encourage positivity and do I encourage students to ask questions, people to ask questions, my children to ask questions, but what is it really that I'm encouraging? Because that's what you're going to get more of. I hope that helps. I'll see you on another episode. Take care and have a great day. And that's going to do it for this edition of the show. As always, I thank you for listening. I appreciate all feedback. So if you have feedback, please don't hesitate to give it. If you have ideas for the show or for guests, please let me know about those. You can leave feedback on the website at www.gracyjujitsurocks.com. You can also leave feedback on iTunes. And while you're there, make sure to rate the show. It helps us with our standing in iTunes. If you haven't liked us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter, please go ahead and do that. And don't forget to share the episodes on your Facebook and social media. Again, thanks again for listening. And until next time, this is Marty Josie, and I'll see you on the mat.